All right. So welcome everyone to this workshop um, with Daniel Duza and Irene Goto. I'm very glad to be with you. My name is Reese Randall. And I'd like to introduce the topic of the workshop, learning from teachers' perceptions about moving online to online education during COVID-19. So without further ado, over to you, Daniel Duza and Irene Goto. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, thank you for coming to our workshop. Uh, today we are going to talk about the study we did in 2020, um, investigating what English teachers working in Japan uh, thought about online teaching, which includes the strengths, weaknesses, and challenges of online teaching. And we'll first start with the background of this study, and then we'll present the results. And following that, we will have a discussion uh, where we like all of you to join and think about how to solve some of the problems of online teaching. Yeah, so we all face significant changes and challenges at the onset of pandemic. Um, just like other countries, Japan started emergency road learning during the pandemic. And most of the time, however, many universities and schools provided knowledge-based content in forms of recorded lectures and there was little synchronous teaching and the lectures were simply recorded and provided to the students so students had to learn from the recording and online teaching was merely a d duplication of the traditional classroom where the teacher was the center of learning and soon enough there was lots of criticism on this kind of online teaching and before our study many students were quite disappointed with the lack of personal communication with classmates and lack of feedback, personal feedback from the teachers. Um, and many teachers have reported that they didn't know how to shift face-to-face -face teaching to online teaching as it required different teaching strategies and new teacher roles. And one of the reasons teachers were reluctant to teach online was that they weren't giving enough time to shift online and get training so they are afraid of messing up their lessons in front of students and this situation made me interested in how teachers working in japan perceive the advantages and disadvantages of online teaching that resurfaced in the wake of covid 19. and i was particularly interested in whether teachers noticed any differences in students' willingness to communicate in online classes because teachers believe that it's difficult for students to learn communication skills and speaking skills effectively in online settings. And finally, I, wa I wanted to see if there are any common themes among the teachers regarding online teaching. So we decided to conduct an online survey. It was collected from 16 English teachers working in different educational settings in Japan, six university professors, five college teachers, and five private teachers. Um, both multiple choice questions and open-ended questions were included, and we analyzed the open-ended questions qualitatively and categorized their answers into similar themes. Um, additionally, we found out that only one teacher was an experienced online teacher and other teachers who responded to the survey had just started online teaching for the first time after the pandemic. And here's the result. Surprisingly, most teachers considered that online teaching was beneficial. The three most frequently cited, cited strengths of online teaching were increased interaction and participation, safety and flexibility and facilitating teaching. The three most frequently cited weaknesses were technical issues, less interaction or bonding among students, and increased distraction and L1 use. Um, interestingly, uh, interaction was cited as both strengths and weaknesses of online teaching. So here, I like to focus on interaction. Many teachers reported that student interaction increased in online settings. Teachers often thought that this is due to students' reduced anxiety. The online environment seems to enable students to be more open and self-expressive. Particularly shy students or those that are not 
motivated seem to benefit from attending online classes than conventional classrooms. On the other hand, some teachers reported that online teaching leads to limited interaction among students. And after analyzing students' uh, teachers' um, responses, I found out that there were more instances of concerns for lack of student-student interactions than teacher and student interactions. And most teachers reported that students, um, particularly freshmen, seemed to be isolated because they couldn't meet their classmates physically, which these teachers thought adversely affected their motivation to learn. Um, also, some teachers linked the absence of verbal cues, such as facial expressions and gestures, to communication difficulties and challenges in online teaching. One other important point in these results is the perceived difference between students' willingness to communicate and in face-to-face -face and online classes. 10 out of 16 teachers noticed differences in students' willingness to communicate, and among them, 8 teachers saw a positive change, and only 2 teachers mentioned a negative change. And teachers' responses showed that technology enabled them to monitor students' progress in real time, which made it possible for them to offer individualized feedback and instruction through private chats and emails. And teachers who shared negative attitudes about online classes were concerned about the lack of interaction between first-year students online, as we've seen in the previous slides. Um, however, poor interaction was improved by teachers who attempted to design synchronous group activities. And here, synchronous means that students get together at the same time and complete tasks with other members in breakout rooms or in small groups. So now, what were other reasons for the perceived increase in students' willingness to communicate? Well, it seems like students were positively influenced by their home culture. That is, students were less concerned about taking online lessons because they were in their private space, which was often their bedrooms. And students were less concerned about the school rules, and this seems to enable them to be more e expressive. In the survey, we also asked teachers about some of the challenges in online teaching. The most frequent challenges mentioned were the new rules uh, required online, and I think it's closely related to Japanese culture because traditionally Japanese teachers control the dissemination of information and students are expected to speak in class only when called on by teachers and teachers are expected to be the authority. However, teaching online requires teachers to shift roles from being the authority to the facilitator and technology shouldn't merely replicate Replicate lectures from traditional classrooms, but transform learning to be student-centered. But because many teachers have just started teaching online during the pandemic, they have neither received appropriate instruction nor sufficient training in integrating technology, content, and pedagogy. Most of them didn't know how to teach effectively online. Um, other challenges Japanese teachers faced in online classes were their prior experiences and beliefs that online teaching is inferior, which influenced how technology was used in their classroom. And research shows that teachers' willingness to teach online is dependent largely on their background and proficiency in using technology. Now, uh, we've seen the results of the survey and some of the challenges of online teaching. Um, let's share our situations. Okay, um, if you can turn on your camera and your microphone, uh, we've only got a small group. We're not going to go to breakout rooms. Um, I'm glad you're here, Paul, because there was a point uh, Marina raised in slide seven that uh, most of the teachers found that students could connect with what they were learning and be more expressive because they were in their home space. They were where they were used to texting and talking to their friends on their phone. And when it came to classroom, all of that was being transferred across. And I was just thinking in extensive reading, 
some schools give time during class to do extensive reading, and that's not bad. But I mean, ideally, you would want them to get into the habit on the train, in their bedroom, and connect with that. I mean, is, is have you thought about anything cognitively about encouraging teachers to encourage that kind of personal space connection with extensive reading? I, I don't remember any research in the stuff we've produced over the years. Do, do you mean encouraging more reading done in class, which is kind of not typical, or do you mean continuing to do it outside of class? I don't quite get Yeah, your trying to here. encourage them to get into the good reading habit without the school even being present. In other words, outside the class, beyond the classroom. And uh, beyond from, my, from my experience, the vast majority of teachers expect their students to do the, their reading outside of class, which mm. actually I... I I advocate spending a little bit of time in class doing reading because it tells students, oh, this isn't so important if I don't have to do it in class. Mm -hmm. So from my, my perspective, it's a little bit different. Mine is trying to show students that yes, reading is important. Therefore, I'm gonna devote 10 minutes of our class time, our valuable class time to doing reading, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to, oh, it's just something you do outside of class. We don't even talk about it. It's good for you. Yes, that, that's kind of my perspective on it more. It's a little bit different than, than what you guys are talking about. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so basically, um, yeah, thanks, Paul. Sure. I was just interested in that because you're here, okay, which is kind of a little bit off track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sure we've all had some experience about student behaviour and reaction to learning and sharing and communication must have changed since they were learning from home. And I'd just like to hear your perspectives. Is it any, any different or unique to what we experienced in our survey and in our um, teaching lives here in Japan? If anyone would like to share, please. Did you notice anything different about students' motivation, learning, uh, what do I say, academic, like, level change their yeah, ipsity feedback in other words how much they could learn during covid as opposed to what they were doing when they were coming to school or any other issue it's just open house at the moment oh, yeah, I go. yeah if i can just oh. jump in sorry uh from from my perspective here in korea i sorry I Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that um, there were there were some changes in, in terms of how much the students were able to produce um, and particularly in terms of the yes I do agree the the assignments and the amount of assignments did increase um, but I do feel like the, the completion rate and the amount in which students were able to participate and engage because they, there was that implicit expectation um, from both the institution, but also um, definitely within themselves to, okay, this is online learning. We have to be engaging in a different way. We can't necessarily engage in the same um, way. So there is a bit more that we need to do assignment wise. Mm -hmm. But yeah, of course there, there were some students who were dealing with a number of different home challenges uh whether it be you know taking care of family um or working jobs to support their family and then they're not able to quite keep up with the the different kind of learning that they're not perhaps uh, familiar with um doing so much in the way of like assignments or, or mm. you know like I, I did video based <clears throat> discussion platforms that there was great engagement but there were always those cases of some students um, finding it challenging with their juggling so many different things during a pandemic. Okay. And Wayne, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, uh, I was going to say that I had a couple of oh, few things. Um, the teacher's attention, I think, was also te or teacher motivation. So I know there is a lot of uneven, in my situation, a lot of uneven teaching. So I taught every day, all my classes via Zoom. So my students saw me every week, uh, 60 minutes per class. And we just 
moved on every week as much as possible. So they got a lot of input from me, a lot of direct contact. But there were other teachers who taught like uh, once a month or they taught maybe they did, they, they split the students up into smaller groups and then they did like, you know, a rotation. So they only saw, uh, you know, a group of students like maybe six times out of the year. So that was very, that was very different. Uh, and I think that affects the students because one student will come along and get a lot of imp input and then they're gone. Okay, see you in two weeks when your rotation comes back up. So I think that puts a bit of a block on things. Also, uh, student attention. Yes, yeah, you're saying students are doing other things. So if they, because they see online as, oh, it's on my K tie. So I can be walking to baseball practice or I could be at home outside on my deck while I'm doing my language class. Hmm. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, Tim, you seem yeah, to be, well, well, do you want to share something? <laughs> that me? Yeah. Um, so I work down in New Zealand where um, we have students from all, all over the world or did have students from all over the world. Um, and I was lucky enough to be in a school or a university where uh, we had about a month's warning that this could happen. You may have to teach online. should make sure you've experimented with uh, this, that and the, and the other, other thing. And yeah. the students as well. I and mean, in fact, the, the, day, the, the government did do a, a national lockdown in, in March. And, and the day before, just the day before, we had all the students bring their laptops into class, install Zoom, do Zoom around, help each other out. And so we all knew how to use it. A little bit, and I had and I had friends though who work in a language school down in the city, uh, and one of the schools was quite insistent. We will not teach online. It's not as good. We will not do it. Um, and then the government said everyone must stay home for two months, and that, and everyone in that school was like, oh, oh. Uh, but the, when, when we were like, okay, we, we've had a few hours of training on this, so at least we can do it. Um, yeah. And we found I, the course I work on is a daily language class, so. Uh, it, the students would normally spend three or four hours a day in the language classroom, and they'd be working in small groups, moving around, mingling with all those things. Um, and we did find them pretty quickly online, as, as many, many other people found around the world as well, according to the research, that you know, three or four hour blocks of class on the Zoom screen doesn't really work. Um, and there's something about the way your brain works when you're talking to people or a group of people is one thing, but when you've got all the different faces on the screen in front of you your brain's trying to process all these individual streams and it actually will hurt your eyes and hurt your brain more mm. so we we did we certainly found that we had to split the class up to last longer from start to finish but have lots many smaller chunks so we'd have a, a bit of time together for half an hour do some activities and some speaking then send students away for 45 minutes to do some reading or some listening or do something in small groups because some of them were living in apartments together which was we had about 48 hours to reorganize students' accommodation. They all got to little, little bubbles that they lived in together. And, and that certainly helped. Um, mm -hmm. they, I mean, they, we, we could break things up as well. The, the students said that they liked it because they were in a foreign country. They were on their own. If we did not keep teaching, they'd have nothing to do for two months at all except watch the news and watch the disasters in their home countries. They were very much, thank you for keeping going with something. But no one can cope with three or four hours on Zoom teaching or learning all, all at once. Um, the main problem was the students were doing it from their beds, which meant that we couldn't even get them up and moving around because they wake up two seconds before class. Yeah. And they don't turn on their camera. At some do, some did, some did, yeah. but some didn't. I mean, the, the, uh, one of the early bits of feedback was great. We don't have to get up so early, come up the hill to university. We can stay a bit an hour longer. In fact, they stayed a bit an hour and a half longer and had not had breakfast, mm -hmm. had not woken up and not combed their hair. They woke up mm -hmm. before class. Yeah. And yeah, that actually brings a point that uh, Reese raised. Uh, Reese raised a good point, but um, the fact that they're not, especially in this country, there's 90 minutes where they're not on the train. Now, of course, Japanese trains are as quiet as as quiet as a morgue office. They're a very great place to um, study, but most of the students are not at the terminal, so they only have standing space in a cramped train. So if they're not um, yeah, traveling, there's there's an extra 90 minutes of stress in their day. They've got all of that energy and space. And like you said, Tim, they just roll out of bed and, you know, come to class and, yeah, do their group. Yeah. 
thing that you mentioned too, it, it's not even high flex. You had people in breakout rooms, but they were physically together in breakout rooms online. And what's that? <laughs> That's high virtual flex or something? We need to come up with a term for that. <laughs> Actually, it, it, we were lucky that because our students were, had a pastoral team as well, and we were able to reorganize their accommodation in, in the 48 hours and say, okay, so you three are in the same class and you're only from the same country, which gives a bit of mutual support when you're overseas and, they, and you're all living together now. Um, so that, there was that level. Every, everyone had a different experience. Everyone, everyone mm. did it differently. But so, certainly, I mean, some of our students, our government said you can go outside for a walk, you can go walking around, just stay away from other people. But a lot of our students were phoning every day, phoning their families in, in China or, or Vietnam and being told by their parents, don't go outside, it's dangerous. And so some of them, it turned out, actually spent two months having food delivered to the door inside and never going out when they, when they could have exercised. Mm. And, that, and that made a difference to their motivation, to their health, to their concentration. Um, so, okay, I'll stop talking for a while. Yeah, well, pretty much, Tim, we can go straight to the conclusion now because you've raised a lot of issues that <laughs> are very important. So what we're going to do is a reverse case study. Try to remember what Tim said about being, some schools being prepared, some schools not being prepared. And we're going to present some of the, the theory behind it all and why it works and why it doesn't work. And maybe even Tim, you can probably see why, even though you did some of the things, they didn't work, okay? So let's have a look at the screen, slide 11, Marina. Um, now we've discussed some of your challenges and some of your testimonies about online teaching. We're going to look at seven of the main issues that came back from the survey. Marina? Yes, so we grouped the teachers' responses um, and seven issues into themes. And first, we are going to look at the pedagogical issues, uh, which includes balancing synchronous and asynchronous learning and using chats and how to use breakout rooms to increase teacher interaction. Okay, so here's some questions. Uh, we did organize this presentation for a bigger group, but since we're all here, um, let's just summarize the questions and think about it and just let's uh, share our ideas about these questions, Marina. Okay, so yeah, can can you explain what activities are best conducted? <laughs> we've we've changed our rehearsal marina, so <laughs> we have to add lib a bit. Yeah, so I mean, can you explicitly explain what activities are best? I'm talking to the participants here today, right? Best done in the classroom, or what is best to be done either as a group beyond the classroom or even given as individual online outside the classroom work. Can you explicitly explain what you would move in and out of the classroom? The other thing to think about is, have you ever used chat for providing feedback or guidance like I have today, if you check the chat? Have you ever done that during your lessons? And um, how do you use breakout rooms to facilitate uh, interactions and more communication between the students. Does anyone have any, any like cheats, hints, breakthroughs or anything like that? Or any of these uh, points? Ah, George, good on you. I had a feeling you were going to talk because you were quiet in the last round, but round two, you're gonna come out swinging. Here he comes. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know about that, but um, I, I don't know. Feedback is just such a critical part of learning. And uh, it seems to me, yeah, especially with the chat, um, I, I would have an activity uh, where students would be in breakout rooms and they'd brainstorm, like I'd ask them a question, like, ah, something that uh, you will never, never do again. And they need to make a list of things they'll never do again. And each person is expected, you know, come up with like maybe three things. And then we come back as a class and each person has to share one of those things. And mm. in that process, using the chat box, I would give them feedback about, you know, especially pronunciation, but also, um, you know, grammar. And so 
uh, I, I don't know. It's not, you know, it's explicit correction, uh, but mm. it's not interrupting the flow of communication. So mm. in that sense, it's kind of somewhere, I, I don't know what you would call it. It's, it's, it's really, the online world has, has really, uh, I, I think there needs to be new definitions of, of feedback, mm. but um, I, I, I thought that was quite helpful. Yeah, thanks, thanks, George. Okay, well, I can already finally I can help somebody. Yeah, what what you've done is a good idea, but if you'll notice what George did, and this isn't a criticism, this is just actually new pedagogy and having collaborative learning and peer correction and all of that has changed the way we assess student participation. So when you said they go away, you say, you know, tell us what you did on the weekend or tell us 12 movies you've watched in your life that you like or tell us two movies you like in your life. Where's the communication in that? So what, what we do now is we get students to choose a question first and then talk to your friend and report about your friend. That increases the motivation then for them to communicate. Now, the implicit motivation to use English is you have to report on the chat about your friend in English. So don't tell me in Japanese because I can't translate, right? So what, how do I say that in English? So then they're using other skills as well to help each other communicate. And yeah, I use the chat, but I also use, um, what is it, class comment in Google Classroom as well. So my warming up activity is like that, and they report using uh, the class comment as well. Yeah, so that's um, yeah, that was that's a good idea. And um, yeah, in Japan, like that, we've been had this drum down our throat basically to use communicative techniques, and the best one I found was always just using third person. And third person is also really good practice for Asians because they neglect, you know, where does the S go on the verb or the noun, you know, and gives them a lot of practice about that as well. So yeah, thanks for that, George. Um, yeah, so that kind of covers my breakout room uh, uh, hint as well, number three, what we do for breakout rooms. Uh, let's just go on a little bit because we are getting close to time. Uh, we've got a little bit more to go. We were going to do Jamboard Marina, but I think it's a bit pointless. We're kind of live. Yeah. Um, uh, but if you've never done Jamboard before, has anyone ever used Jamboard before? Oh, Marina, these guys are going to love it. Oh, thanks, Reese. Okay. Reese, your mentor. Okay. And Paul, you need this. And everybody else, after you master Jamboard, you, you, your students are just going to love collaborating. So, Marina, let's let's share this with them. Yeah, this was okay, a. I'll send the link for chat. Mm -hmm. So on, okay. it's on the here's chat. The, yeah. Yes, here's the link to Jamboard. Yeah, so please click this link. Um, it'll download a program that steals all of your bank information, and also, <laughs> the first bit's a lie. It'll open up uh, an ISP. It's actually not an app, but these days they call it an app, the browser app, which is actually an internet service provider. But anyway, uh, let's not get technical. And what will happen is it'll open up Jamboard. Yeah. In a second, there it is, like this. Okay, Marina. Yeah, so there's a function pane on the left side of the screen and mm -hmm. uh, you can choose the pens or eraser or select button or sticky notes or pictures or shape. They can insert picture mm -hmm. shapes and there is also a text box. box. And uh, would you like to look at the sticky notes? It's on yeah, the I'll stop screen. showing off. Hey. <laughs> Fourth tool, yeah, from the top and yeah, it opens up this menu and you can type in whatever you like and also you can choose any colors and after clicking save yeah the memo's there and you can change the size and move around and also clicking <laughs> the three dots yeah you can you know edit duplicate or delete 
Mm. And this is, yeah, I use uh, this all the time with my um, students, uh, teenagers, and it's really good for brainstorming and also collaborating. Mm. Yeah. So everybody, uh, since you're in, just just um, click the sticky note, which is the fourth one, okay, and just leave a message. Just leave a message or leave any question. You don't. We've already answered the three questions. What's up? Nothing much. By the way, all of your keyboard shortcuts work too. So if I click on what's up and go control C, which is copy and control V, then I get a new one. And I've copied the, copied the, um, the, the message. And also if you double click the message, it automatically opens up into edit as well. And then Australian reply, nothing much. Save. Oh, nice. Okay, we're all starting to play. So as you can see, there's a different, you can go beyond the um, language response. Uh, students can put pictures and drawings and things like that. So this allows you to do all of your task-based language teaching um, style feedback as well. Okay. okay. And if you'll notice at the top, Marina, because we're not going to use Jamboard uh, for the rest of this presentation. You want to talk about what's happening at the top? Yeah, you can have um, 20 frames for one Jamboard. Yeah, it's kind frames of... Frames equate to pages yes. in, in paper books. That's yeah. Paul's language, yeah? Pages. <laughs> yeah, and as you see, we've uh, put all of our questions at the top of each page. And um, we can put feedback in those pages, but um, we can still use the Jamboard today. Okay, so everybody, please leave your um, Jamboard open. We might actually use it, Marina. Let's go back to the presentation, and we need to bali bali. We need to speed up a bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Jamboard is a Google thing. It says Google, right? Yeah, I it's think, a, yeah, I think Google suit. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so let's get back to the responses. What did we learn from the Japanese uh, teachers, Marina? I hope I'm sharing my screen. Yes, yes, thank you. So um, to decide what to do in class online, um, we should consider the following, which is synchronous learning makes it possible for real-time discussion, which provides immediate feedback and interaction with a live audience. So synchronous learning is beneficial for increasing social emotional engagement, and this was very important during the pandemic. Um, on the other hand, asynchronous learning enables students to work at their own pace. So this improves students' reflections, deep thinking, and this results in increased quali quality of interaction and higher order thinking skills. So a this, if I could just butt in there, um, if you understand Hale Reinders' uh, tasks beyond the classroom and learning from task repetition beyond the classroom, um, all of the theory and psychology behind that is appropriate for asynchronous learning. A little bit of homework for everybody. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> Marina. Hey. Yeah. So asynchronous learning is especially useful for prolonged input and prolonged output, like reading and research and writing, uh, watching videos and preparing presentations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And We've so we gone could. through all of this pretty much, yeah. haven't we? Yeah. Let's let's do the next next ones now, because we are starting to run out of time. The next one is working with technology issues. Marina. Yes. Um, allocating extra time to prepare for online classes and providing guidance to familiarize students with online procedures. Mm -hmm. So here's two questions we'd like to talk about. You can talk about other issues. And I just want to stress, we're talking about working with technology. I'll define that a bit later. 
Um, so do you have any problems with preparing for online lessons? And can you suggest any shortcuts or give us a testimony of your cross that you carried to Calvary and how difficult it was teaching with technology? Or the other question is, um, do you provide step-by-step -step instructions for students when they have to use technology for learning or assessment or doing homework or whatever? How do you get the students to get through the tech challenge to um, finish their work? So these are the two issues we're talking about learning with technology, okay? Uh, these two questions are in the Jamboard. So if you would like to revert back to the Jamboard and it's, what do you call it, frame two? I'm still using slide because I'm a presenter and Paul uses pages. <laughs> anyway, Jamboard language is frame, okay, frame two. So yeah, more. the question four is about time, the time you spend. And the second one is more the student focus. How do you get them to na navigate and use all of this technology that they had to do during uh, COVID? Okay, do you have any ideas? Um, by the way, you don't have to write in Jamboard. You can turn on your microphone and just, just talk. Okay, Wayne, thanks. Yeah, uh, something I do is, um... It, well, I just go. Th I, I I I go through it with them and make a PowerPoint and then put it into the learning the LMS, the learning management system, so it's always there for reference. Like um, recently, we used Flipgrid, so I'm using Flipgrid this semester, and some students didn't really know how to get onto Flipgrid, or like uh, when I showed them the QR code or things like that, they didn't really know uh, which email address should I use and stuff. So. Obviously I run through all that myself so that when I do it, I can explain it to them. And then sure. I just, uh, I, I block out the time in my schedule to do that. So if I'm learning, if I'm using the tech, if I'm using the tech and the students have never used it, I think it's, it's, it would be irresponsible of the teacher to be like, okay, let's hurry up and get through this. Um, because not everyone might understand. So you kind of got to slow it down and make sure that you have enough time in class and you're accessible enough to the students to be able to get through the, get through the time, get through the time. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to use the tech, you need to block out the time to instruct the students. And I found in Japan anyway, I found with my students, they really like the step-by-step, -step, let's do this together kind of approach that's that was that's that's my experience well once they get it once they get up once once it gets up and running they're uh yeah they're all about it they're good to go um i don't want to say what mcm do means but um in the military, we used to we used to say this, and it's not very offensive, but basically, soldiers are considered to be monkeys, and um, we see monkey see, oh, monkey see, monkey see. like this, do that. The trainer always says, like this, do that, like this, do that. And actually, you're right, Wayne. Um, using technology and introducing new technology in the class is a great chance for a TBLT phase in your lesson. Because the, it's it's language in use and that funnel where they have to understand the language and interact with the language is essential. And the feedback is a linguistic outcome. You can see they've done they've done the tech thing. So next time you say it, hopefully, um, if it's something they're going to do each week, hopefully in your lesson the first time there was a little bit of repetition. So in the next yeah. lesson. You just need to say a few key words and in groups, they can walk each other through it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm going to just say like this, do that. Okay. So, yeah, a, a little bit of repetition in, especially like opening up Google Docs and sharing a doc or working collaboratively on a doc or in a spreadsheet or something like that. Um, yeah, 
provide repetition and no linguistic uh, outcome on the first try, which is something we're going to talk a little bit about later. So basically the first time you do the activity, it's not a language focus, it's task yeah. focus. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, George, you got anything? Um, yeah, Jamboard works well inside the whole Google Suite. Uh, I just added it for all my students. Great. Good on you. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I like what Wayne said, you know, like, I mean, just, yeah, talking people through things. And, and that's, you know, I mean, really, there's a communicative purpose there, right? Um, so they're, they're, they're learning and they're using English to learn something. So, yeah, that's, that's about it. That's what I got. Yeah, I see you, Paul. Thanks, uh, George. Cool. So I'm not teaching, um, but what I've discovered working with teachers and sometimes having my uh, patients pushed to the limit, and I do have a lot of patients, is the understanding that... You have a lot of teachers um, too. There's <laughs> <yeah. laughs> so one, one funny story. So I was giving a presentation to a group of teachers in Taiwan, like 40 teachers, and they were all saying how, you know, they really didn't like teaching online because they can't interact with the students and the students refuse to turn on their video and they can't be forced to turn on the video, whatever. And then I gave a presentation of 40 teachers of none of which would turn on their video. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> Every yeah, time. It's so oh like, yeah. And exactly. it's so demotivating. And someone, I think someone said that earlier, or maybe in the previous presentation, actually Joe Tomei was talking about how demotivating it is to talk to a bunch of blank spaces. Uh, but on a more, uh, I think, useful note is that we have to understand, like I, I have teachers who just, I guess, can't believe they've screwed something up. And that sometimes it is just because they're dumb as hell. But more often, it turns out that they are using multiple systems and each one's a little bit different, you know, especially part-time teachers yeah. um, might be like, yes, you know, I know you do it this way, but I have three other schools and they all do it slightly differently. And just, you know, it's hard to keep track. So I think we need to be patient. Uh, again, I don't know in your teaching context, but there could be other teachers who are using other similar tools, which are kind of similar enough to be confusing for the students because, oh, you know, was it this tool or that tool that I'm supposed to do these steps? So I think that that's mm -hmm. something we've, we've uh, discovered in the digital age with all these new and amazing digital tools mm -hmm. is that it's hard to keep track of which features and, and how you apply each of them from a user perspective. Mm. That's interesting what Paul said. Yeah, the teachers, yeah, and same where I work at Kiffle, you know, there's a lot of part-time teachers. There's only half a dozen of us that are full-time. And yeah, all of the teachers, some of them have similar systems, but there's a little quirk. And then when they come to work, you know, it's the end of the day, they're tired and they've proceduralized the other organization's way of doing things. But the other thing at Kiffel is we don't have a standard way of using tech. So this problem relates to our students and they're the ones paying the bill. And I think as organizations go, at least those, those universities that I know of in Tokyo, they have a standard way all teachers need to use. They just mandated that it was, it was really kibishi, it was really clunky, but at least it meant when the students came to the class, they knew how to operate the system. But yeah, Kim mm -hmm. were given all of the, you know, freedom to use whatever tech. Some were Seesaw, some were Google Classroom, some were photocopying papers, scanning it and... <laughs> <laughs> you know, asking for people to buy carrier pigeons and you know it was every student was really stressed at first yeah so it was really hard and um yeah tim raised something that i want to raise now um at least in your organization tim they they, they saw the tidal wave coming and they prepared right in my organization i warned them three months before COVID even came i said we need to learn to teach online and augment our teaching. So when we have to teach online, we just flick a switch and everybody's ready. And they said, no, nah, it's a waste of time. <laughs> and three months later, at least they were humble enough to say, Daniel, we need, we need to train these teachers. We need help. And yeah, I was really busy. But yeah, yeah I, I tried yeah. to avoid the burden. But anyway, that was just me being efficient or yeah. late. 
Yeah, yeah go on. Paul. Yeah, to add to that point, Daniel, yeah, because I'm helping hundreds of schools, and yeah, there was such a difference between the ones that said, okay, let's just start doing it, and the ones that said, you know what, we're going to take a two-week delay and train people. Yeah, and those programs just went so much more smooth, so much, you know, smoothly than the ones who just tried throwing teachers and students right into it. Oh, they'll figure it out. It, it was just so demotivating. So yeah, I, I definitely saw what you're talking about. I saw it at so many different schools and, and you're absolutely right. Schools that prepared, whether it was prepared in advance or took a break to give teachers a chance to prepare, did so much better. Mm, yeah, and it's a shame because since 1996, I've been working with professors about teaching online, the benefits of teaching online and doing, uh virtual books, you know, what you're doing, Paul, and everyone's just been like yada yada, you know, just which <laughs> are very Korean people, which means just shut up, you're saying too much, you know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, good point. And we're going to come up uh with that kind of in the next session. Um please talk about the recommendations uh that we've got here, Marina, because there's a little bit of extra stuff in there. Please. Sorry. Um, uh, no, <laughs> it's fine. So, um, yeah, technology makes tasks more accessible and efficient and reduces, you know, teacher workloads tremendously. And however, it does require training practice and reflection for self-improvement. Um, and I, I just want to um, mention what Wayne said before that, um, um, the importance of um, being uh, together with the students and going step by step and Japanese students really appreciated that and as uh, at the onset of pandemic I was also helping with um, Japanese teachers uh, working in elementary schools um, introduce uh, tech because uh, Mixed uh, speeded up the introduction of um, uh, tech one device for one student in elementary schools um, and now all the elementary school kids have it but um, at some schools like teachers hated working with tech and they had allergy to it so that they didn't try to open the box full of iPads and then they just left the box there um, and <laughs> yeah <laughs> and <laughs> when I talked Sorry. with them what they said was that they just want somebody next to them so so that you know they can like help them start with how to log into the device and how to make google classroom and you know how to do things and i think that's what students needed and that's what teachers also needed because they didn't have any you know um yeah uh, instructions or training yeah, and just to uh, let you know, if you weren't reading the chat, yeah, Tim said he's got a friend that teaches refugee kids and they spent time training as well. So, yes, training and rehearsal is very important. And, yeah, taking baby steps, you know, using that target-based approach and working back and scaffolding and realising what do they need. And, uh, yeah, it was a lot at first. There's a few other things that I'd like to raise your attention about with tech, um, even if you are a tech savvy person. Technology makes tasks more accessible and efficient. That's, that's why we use tech. You know, you, you jump on a bus, why? Because you don't want to drive and you don't want to, right? Okay, the um, technology used uh, with well-designed activities can reduce teacher workload tremendously while increasing student contact time with the material, tasks, and language to achieve projects and task goals. Um, this, this author who said that uh, is a TPAC um, advocate, which is technology, pedagogy, and content knowledge um, integration. Um, yeah, when, when I use tech, I try and make it so that the activity almost is self-assessing. And I make the activity so that the peers have to help the other person correct, because I will put them in groups and I will judge the group. So there's that pressure then to correct each other. And it saves my work completely. 
And if you're really, really, how do I say, inquisitive, you can go back in your Google Docs through the history and see who is helping who. It's really amazing that you can do all of that kind of stuff. I'm sure there's apps out there that even have a more uh, user-friendly way of doing it. Um, the last one is teachers should guide students how to generate their own material. Sorry, Paul. I get my students to write their own stories and then grade their stories so that their friends can uh, read it. So it's kind of extensive writing and extensive reading all in the same step. You go, on, Paul, you, you, you're going to teach me something <laughs> we now have a new section in us uh, since you mentioned me we have Here a section we go. Next promo. student first writers. a word from our sponsor sorry paul <laughs> we Here now have on. a section called a section called student writers hey. it's a category in x reading under the auth, under the publishers so if your students have actually written books and you want to put them on x reading let me know and i got the idea from Paul, you're here on my screen, by the way. I got the <laughs> idea from Paul because when we were in Tokyo that time with David Baird and Marina was there as well. And um, that really nice lady, I can't remember her name. Marina does. What's her name? We had a picture together. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you mentioned this was coming back then. It was about three or four years ago. So mm -hmm. yeah. and that's when I got the idea. I just went straight back to work and just started on it. Yeah. Let's definitely talk later on. Yeah, I want to hear how your experience went. Mm, oh, short answer, really well. Okay. Good. All right. Um, so we finished. Yeah, here's the recommendations, Marina. Yeah, routines um, need to be set up in online lessons just as face-to-face -face lessons mm -hmm. require lesson planning and sequencing. Um, although students... Uh, so um, Tim... Um, wrote on chat that um, digital natives are only native at things they like um, and not always <laughs> things we want them to do or use and we were trying to raise yeah this point yeah mm. and not at a hundred new apps a week from each different teacher yeah so we need to consider this and you know, the, yeah, although they are digital natives, they may not necessarily know how to use technologies to assist their learning. Um, and yeah, tech integration should be either intuitive or have a rehearsed face when new software apps or new le learning de devices are introduced. Mm -hmm. to ensure a smooth a rehearsal system. phase, yeah. Mm, yeah. That's right. And it's also uh, beneficial Oops. to see other t uh, how other teachers uh, introduce a similar app and mm. use it for learning. Mm. And here's the other recommendation about working with tech uh, routines. I mentioned that before. If they can proceduralize the routines, um, for example, I do fluency reading um, before I give them extensive reading. Um, they have an app where they get together in groups, they write down where they read the material from Breaking News English, they put the URL in there, and they record their times as they read the same story over and over again. It's just for fluency. Um, you can read that in Paul Nation's Reading for Fluency book. And um, yeah, so the routines are really good. Um, yeah, working with tech the first time is really stressful, and it just taxes the brain and there's not much learning that can happen. But once the routine is there, the learning uh, increases, fluency increases, and their enjoyment increases as a result. Um, yep. All of you pretty much covered everything that we've presented here today. The last one is working through technology. <coughs> Pardon me. Yeah, so Daniel, what is the difference between working with technology and working through technology? Uh, I'm going to challenge the participants because these guys look like they're tech savvy. Come on, guys. What, what do you think working through technology is? Give us an example. I'm not, I'm not going to preach to the, the preachers. <laughs> what, what's the difference? I kind of hinted before when I mentioned working with technology yeah, the I'm, first time. I was talking about Calvary. Yeah, I, I, I guess it seems like working with te with technology is more uh, just trying to transfer what you were doing in the classroom online through different medium, 
we're working through maybe it's actually involving the technology as part of uh, learning, uh, as, as, as changing your learning and your activities to use the technology um, or designing it around the technology rather than just transferring from mode A to mode B? Yeah, that's that's one one thing for sure. Mm -hmm. One thing for sure. Um, hmm. Where are we working with technology? What is working through technology? Give me a second. Okay, so the previous slide was talking about working with technology and working with technology is when you are physically, cognitively, stressfully struggling or manipulating or have to be conscious about operating technology. Now, at the moment, I'm on Zoom and flicking from the screen to Jamboard and then looking at my notes and then writing on the chat, that's working with technology. But Zoom is also giving me working through technology. In other words, I'm looking at Paul and in my mind, I'm talking directly to Paul. And I kind of want to even pass him a coffee right now, even though you're talking to the ball right now. <laughs> so I, I'm not conscious of all of the technology in the Zoom part, the talking part. I'm, I'm just talking naturally. But the working with technology is all of that other flicking switches and stuff like that. However, once that becomes proceduralized, you know, I'm like a DJ mixing songs. You know, it, it just becomes part of my physical language, you know, like judo or karate or something like that. So once you get your moves down, proceduralized, then you're starting to work through technology. But true working through technology is transparent. The students are not um, conscious of the technology. A good example is PlayStation or Nintendo. You give a kid a battery, a Nintendo, and a handpiece, and suddenly they're playing. Nobody taught them the menu system or anything. They just, the technology provides the scaffolding to use the technology. And as teachers, that's where we need to be at. If you can design the activities so that it's, it's intuitive, um, that's also working through technology. Another example is my assessment and my feedback, my corrective feedback, um, my scaffolding, I have the technology in such a way that students can see each other's work. I don't have a problem with cheating. I ask my students, look at what your friend's doing for guidance. And they do. They, you know, they have no inclination to copy the, the, their, their friends because everybody wants to be an individual. But some students, they don't know how to take that first step, especially in college. You know, university students are usually a li little bit more brave about making mistakes. But um, yeah, when they see other students starting to write, they go, ah, that's what the teacher meant. You know, so they have an exemplar. I don't spend time making the exemplar. I get the students to produce that. So that's another way that I'm working through the technology. So just by how I use the technology creates all of these other chances for assessment, you know, support, peer feedback, correction, um, I can see who's writing the fastest, who the leader is in the class. So all of these things are going through my mind when I put people into groups and things like that. All right. There's another thing about working through technology, which is kind of an ethics uh, um, issue. Let's go to recommendation number seven, Marina. On my screen. Oh, we, okay, we're not talking. Uh, how about slide 24? Okay, we'll go to slide 24. <laughs> <laughs> Eel, it's good. Okay, so yeah, two questions we have here is uh, make, making the first task simple and then gradually increase its cognitive and linguistic demands as students get used to technology. And the question is, do you consider this when introducing students to online learning? Mm. And the second one is um, younger students. 
Many of elementary school teachers said、um, encourage students to show and tell using what they have at home since we are doing online teaching. Uh, uh, so, use their belongings or pets. And have you had any problems with privacy while teaching students online?、Mm. And I thought it'll be nice to have discussion here since、um, new participants joined, have joined. Hi, Wesley and Halim. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Marina, can you put the Jamboard link in the chat again? Because、uh, it won't be in Wesley、okay. or yeah, Helen's、uh, chat yet. So, can you click on this link, Wesley? And、uh, we will hack your computer and steal all of your bank information. Can join、this、us on why, Jamboard. Yeah, for being late, I deserved it. <laughs> uh, <that's laughs> Thank、okay. you. If your bank account's anything like me, it's just all bills and not dollar bills. It's the ones we have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> I just posted the link to Jamboard on chat. Mm. Mm. And if you have a look at the screen I'm sharing, I hope you can see this is Jamboard. And we're on page three or Jamboard language frame three. Yeah, frame three. three. At the top, there's a little set of arrows you can click. You in? And there's a menu at the left where we make all of these sticky notes.、Yeah. Hi, where's Lee? There it is. Did I spell your name wrong? Where's Lee? Something's missing. Ah,、oh, there's an E missing. So double click. Pardon me. There we go. We have parity. All right. So, yeah, the two questions are there at the top of the Jamboard.、Um, so, yeah, do you consider. Uh, taking students through steps so that they can automate their tech. And the second one is Have you had any、uh, privacy or ethical issues with、um, privacy issues coming through technology, like seeing inside students' bedrooms and, and privacy things like that? And also setting up some activities. Okay. You can just turn on your mic. You don't need to leave a note on Jamboard. We've still got a small group. Yeah, I guess I. Hi. Yeah, sorry、thanks. to interrupt. Yeah, I, 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 I've been lucky in, in, in some ways. Certainly, when all this all started two years ago, there was lots of stuff in the, in the media and on blogs, I think, recommending you know, be, don't force your students to show, show, show their house. They might be embarrassed about where they live because of what were fam, family circumstances or financial or, or whatever.、Uh, and I've been lucky in some ways that I. Haven't had many, many students in that, in that position, partly because some of them were given university accommodation, so we knew it was reasonable.、Um, but certainly, some courses, when, they, when I've been redeployed to,、um, when I've been yeah, redeployed students,、uh, re redeployed to teach other courses around the university with, with other students, some of them would not turn their cameras on because they, and they were given the chance, don't, you don't have to show us things. In your background, you don't want to. If they, if they had a, a messy bedroom or they lived in a house they weren't proud of.、Um, and so it was, it was interesting just to see the differences between courses. Some were very happy to, some weren't. I only had one incident where someone, someone a bit like me, had a computer looking at them.、Uh, behind me, I put a wall. The student behind them had a, a mirror, a massive, big, whole wall mirror. And they decided to go change clothes down in, their, in the room. Uh, away from the computer, we couldn't see them except the camera was looking at the mirror and the mirror was looking at them.、Um, so I've only had that once and I was quick enough to realize what was going on and realize that I could turn off someone's camera.、Um, and that student was clearly changing all of their clothes.、Um, so I only had that once and they, was clearly, they, were, they were doing it away from the camera. So they, they thought they were being private.、Uh, I, I've been lucky enough to, to only have that once and I only happened for about two seconds before I realized and clicked the camera off. And then they got confused half an hour later. Why is my camera off? Why can no one see me?、Um, mm. no, so so I, I've been very lucky、thing. with that, but we, we, haven't, we, we, ha we haven't pushed students to do anything. But, but they certainly they agree generally, students, that having, having faces in front of you feels more interactive, feels more like a classroom, feels a bit more like a community、mm. than talking to a screen of black faces, or black faces,、mm. black screens.、Um, And they, they seem to agree, but it's,、uh, it's uh, certainly we, we are aware that there are many reasons that we can't force people to show what their house is like or what their view is like because it might be horrible for them or embarrassing. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that was my bit. 
Yeah. Or sometimes there might be like environmental factors out of their control. Um, I did uh, online TAing at my uh, at the university I'm at right now, and say that there might be a student who might not even be aware that their sound is on and their roommate might be up to something in the background, which might be a bit questionable. Um, I have that. So sometimes it's not even anything the students know is going on. So also avoiding the potential for embarrassment there, I think is important. Hmm. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So what about um, what you've seen online or seen other teachers do, because none of us would ever make a mistake. Is there anything you've seen teachers do that you think is a bit, you know, you shouldn't be asking students to do that? I mean, I'm going to share one of my sto stories. I'm not going to mention any names. Um, does anyone have any, any horror stories? Yeah, okay, well, I, I had an argument with a, a supervisor uh, once about an activity that he planned for the curriculum. And basically it was make a video of, uh, how do I say, oh, no, uh, directions, making directions from your house to uh, a famous place in your local area. And the intention was fine. And the example video, I, I told the teacher, I said, you shouldn't say that maybe from even from your station, because then it would be more tourist based, right? You could put that in a YouTube, how to get from such and such station to a famous place in that locality. In, but taking it from your home's local area, that's privacy. And he said, it's not an issue. So I showed him how in two minutes time, I found his house, I found his washing, I found his car, and I said, you know, I know what time you go home. I just need to follow you. I get your car license. And I've got enough information there to cause you real havoc. I know what time you go to work. I know your wife is a worker. I know when your house is empty. I mean, this is all privacy stuff. So he kind of got the point. And this year it was taken out of the activity when it was changed. So, um, yeah, we need to be careful what comes through technology. Not only what we plan and how we use it, but what comes through the technology uh, in our activities. Whoa. I was just going to make that a bit bigger for you. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, I've seen videos actually released by uh, uh, elementary school teachers, Japanese elementary school teachers of their own home. And um, they were careful though. They didn't show private rooms and the toilet was just a toilet. It was clean when they did that. And they didn't show down the street or any neighbor's houses when they introduced their home. So as far as geography goes, you don't know where the house is, right? So they were very careful about all of that privacy stuff. So a lot does leak through the technology, um, which is unintentional. Yeah. But the main thing about uh, technology transparency that we're talking about working through technology is that it doesn't hinder the learning process. It actually makes it, uh, it, it enhances it. It makes it better than what we would have face to face. Okay, Marina. Um, yeah, guidelines, we've done that. Okay, we're up to the summary now, I think, Marina. Yes. We might finish in a few minutes early. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, so, yeah, to summarize some of the things um, successful online teachers uh, do, I think we all talked about this um, includes um, relinquishing um, teachers authoritative control it was very difficult to do this in Japan and allowing students to explore learning share ideas and construct their own knowledge um, providing guidance and direction step by step using technology to monitor progress and provide live written oral feedback, um, provide socially constructive environment for collaboration and rehearsing um, technology use and observing how 
other teachers incorporate technology and tools in their classroom and setting up routines and make procedures intuitive for the students and understanding what and how to choose appropriate teaching strategies and teacher roles. Yeah. Great. <laughs> mm. Yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> thanks, Marina. Yeah, I think the main thing uh, we brought to today's lesson was the, in, the importance of rehearsal. And rehearsal doesn't mean every lesson. If you, if you the teacher, has done the tech before, then you've already rehearsed in previous years. So if you're just doing the same thing again, you don't have to allocate 30 minutes of your time to rehearse. Um, the Remembering each time you get a new class or each time there's a new technology or a new level of activity, remembering to allocate that time um, just in case the students have some problem with tech is important. Um, we even get students to make online portfolios now using Google Sites. And it's, it's about a 200 minute um, deficit on our teaching time, which is about two and a half lessons. It, it takes time. And in college, you know, some of our students are doing job interviews, they're going on holidays, they're doing special events. So they miss how to set up their portfolio. So, you know, we have to spend time after school catching them up. And yeah, that's, that's just one of the weaknesses of, you know, having this responsibility, I suppose, to give our students this skill to use technology. The thing we forget is when you were in, uh, I've forgotten the word, preschool, <laughs> your TN, preschool, your teacher told you how to hold a pencil. Oh, well, she didn't teach me. I still draw like this. But your teacher told you how to hold a pencil. That's why I use a computer. And they teach you how to place your hand on the page. And they teach you how to turn a page on a book. They teach you all of this basic stuff. And when we're teachers, we forget that we were at that stage. And when we have technology and we have digital natives, we forget that they still need those baby steps right at the beginning. And you don't have to assume they can't do it but you need to be ready to provide those scaffolds if someone or someone's in the class don't have it. Of course, you can use classroom management and put people into groups where there's a good mentor that can walk them through it. That helps a lot. Um, some of my lower level students, they are even finding it difficult to communicate in Japanese, let alone the instruction I give in English. So I will give them a student in their group who has already completed the task to just tell them in Japanese, take them through step by step by step. And I can get on with the lesson with the rest of the class. So that's one way I get around that um, deficit in what we have to do with technology. Okay, we're not going to say goodbye. We still have a little bit of time left. Um, and it's open slather. If you've got any questions or you'd like to know just basically anything, how to incorporate technology or anything like that. Uh, one thing I'd like to ask, which I don't think we asked was, do you share your profession about technology? or your problems with technology with your other teachers. I mean, some of us were in Willie Renanger's um, presentation yesterday, and he talks about at the local level, and local means also in your staff room. Are you a positive contributor, or at least an active asker for help? Because think about it, one way of increasing people's tech knowledge in the staff room is you look stupid and ask for help. And that will then force them with their pride to go out and find the answer and come back and tell you. And then when they tell you a substandard answer, you can say, oh, I tried that the other day and I accidentally found this. And you teach them a little bit, right? Okay, you know, 
yeah, humility is difficult for me. But anyway, I, I use those little tricks sometimes. Yeah, people need a nudge. Mm. So I don't know about you, but going going online with technology, my biggest frustration was seeing education fall over when we've had you know 10 or 20 years of warning that this should have already been in our skill set. Yeah, it, it broke my heart daily to, to see that. Being a tech, tech guy and I helped set up my university, what was it, 20 years ago now before I came to Japan? And it became the best online education provider in the Southern Hemisphere for about a decade. Now it's about number five. <clears throat> yeah, and we set up all of that information turned all of the analog gear into digital gear, installed Pro Tools. The, the university was about to spend $20,000, which I think now is about 10 million yen with inflation on an analog recording studio. Oh, my goodness. And the day before they signed the contract, a friend of mine said, you've got to come down to Brisbane and look at this Pro Tools demonstration. And I went back to work early the next day. I said, don't sign the contract. You have to check this out. And Pro Tools came up to my university and um, they bought it for a fraction of the price. It was Mac-based. And then we started putting everything online. And now full-time students access all of the material the same as the distance students do. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, it was frustrating to come here and uh, see this problem really show the weakness in education. It was really, really hard. But I'm glad you guys are here. And I'm, I was, yeah, Marina and I kind of predicted that the group we have um, would be a little bit more on, on the top of the wave. Okay, now, or do you have something to say? Um, yeah, this is about like uh, primary school and secondary school teachers, but even those who are really excited about using uh, tech tools find that with uh, even with Giga School, there's so many blocks like that the schools have or the Board of Ed puts on, um, you know, accessibility to these tools. And so teachers feel frustrated because they've actually taken the time to learn how to use yeah. them and then they can't. Mm -hmm. So... I don't Can know, you I give think... a more precise example of uh, your frustration? I, I um, mean, so, yeah, yeah. I, I, we're in Japan and I have kids in primary school, so i just like yeah, you to um, say that. So. Well, one, one example is because I, I'm a company, we actually wanted to do a virtual exchange and we wanted to use uh, the Discord server. So obviously Discord server is a chat app, but kids use it um, to play games. And so what the teachers had to do was the teachers had to visit the Board of Education and get special permission to unblock um, usage of the server. But I don't think a lot of teachers know that they can do that, that if they feel very strongly about using a certain teaching app, that they actually can appeal and then get permission to unblock certain things. Obviously, it takes conviction and, you know, one teacher probably can't do it. But if a school feels that something is important enough, and the only reason why the schools are worried is usually because of privacy issues. But aside from that, if it, you know, if it benefits learners, then I feel like they should learn how to use it. I mean, at the tertiary level, you're using different LMS. And um, I think it is important for learners to learn uh, the other uh, different kinds if other schools are using them or even the teaching, uh, what is it, the tech apps. So I don't know if teachers themselves know to what extent they can actually fight or advocate for the tools that they want to use. And I wish that there was something like that for teachers where there's like a list of things that, you know, they, they could potentially ask for if they really wanted it. But I think they're hesitant to ask. Uh, just because of the culture yeah that's a good point and also as far as um like foreign teachers assisting these schools we go into <laughs> the classroom with our lesson plan that we did on our computer at home and it doesn't run right right yeah like searching for images on google on Go on google mm -hmm. it says server won't respond 
So you have yeah. to use a workaround, you know? So it's, yeah, it's really frustrating. And of course, you know, I, I don't think we could appeal to let Google search for pictures. I mean, that's, you know, that's too risky. But yeah, I understand completely. I've had this problem in the past. And, um, but it's nice to know that you can appeal. That's really good sharing that information. Mm. Yeah. About that. Mm. That's great. Okay. I think that brings us to an end. Yeah, I'd just like to thank you all for sharing what you've shared. And it was really great that um, you were already predicting what was coming up in the following slides that reduced our burden a bit, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for your contributions. Yeah, and it, it shows that what we're preaching is, is relevant and you're already doing most of those things. I just hope we all go away with something today. And um, yeah, uh, on the slide that's on the screen right now, I hope you can see uh, Marina and my uh, email addresses there. 